I know Peggy is like, oh, Lord, all my dreams are shattered. Oh, oh I didn't marry Jerome and Jackson. Damn it. Bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube and for a small monthly fee of $5. You babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it. If the YouTube gets it, you like these, uh-huh. Go on over there to uptopbeauty.com. Now, let's continue talking about this lady right here. Ooh, Jackson Family Values, Memories of Madness by Margaret Maldondo. She say her last name Jackson, but I, from what I understand, she ain't never married a ninja. Hazel asked me to hold on while she went to a different telephone, apparently not one to talk in front of Jermaine's two older children. When she got back on the line, she hit me with a question that stopped me cold. You aren't planning on giving up this baby, are you, Margaret? She asked. Give him up? To whom? I asked. To Jermaine and me. Hazel said, now sounding as upset as I was. I told her I wasn't about to give Jeremy to anyone, that I had every intention of raising him myself. Hazel was speechless, and I later learned Jermaine had convinced her that I didn't want to keep Jeremy and that they should adopt the child and raise him. She not only had agreed, but had shopped for two of everything, two bassinets, two cribs, Two dressers, two of each outfit. She bought one for Jeremy and one for the child she was carrying. Her voice sounded shaky when I said I was coming to pick Jeremy up. She said she would see to it that Jeremy was safely returned home. Yeah, because you're not about to come to my house with this boy. I don't know you, lady. Okay, Jermaine may know you. JJ may know you. But I don't know you. Don't come to my house with that bush girl. I'll send one of these Jackson drivers round there to to take your baby home but don't come to my house okay i'm i'm highly upset right now and, and somebody might get murked she said she would see to it jeremy was safely returned home i didn't want to cause any problems for hazel who was only days away from giving birth as far as jermaine was concerned however i wanted an explanation and was not about to let him talk his way out of this one baby here comes the passion enters passion women we just be so desperate to hear the words i love you to feel like you you're not going through all of this for nothing that when those words i love you come out they feel so good and they just melt all the realities of the world away when jermaine brought jeremy back to the condo i put the baby to bed and returned to the living room as mad as I'd ever been. I don't know Hazel, I told JJ. I don't know if she has hostile feelings towards me or my child. And I don't want Jeremy left with someone I don't know. Jermaine could feel the heat and tried another sidestep. This time he focused the blame on his older children, Jermaine Jr. and Autumn, telling me how excited they were about having a baby brother and how they begged him to bring Jeremy to the house for the day. This was my Prince Charming. If he'd been Pinocchio, he would have been tripping over his own nose. Yeah, they'd be lying like shit. But guess what? You want to believe those lies when you're in this situation. You want to, with all your heart and soul, just to know that maybe an inkling of what he's saying is true. Because that passion, girl, it got you by the throat. Because that's all it is. When you mess with a married man, that's all it is. It's the intensity of the relationship. Because like I said, them single ninjas rarely shoot their shot. But them married ones, them niggas unload the clip. Jermaine was there on March 17th, 1987, when Hazel gave birth to Jamie, but began spending even more time at the condo with me, playing the good dad. 
One day, he brought Jamie over for a visit to meet his half-brother. I was sure he never let Hazel know that he was bringing Jamie to my house, just as he did to me when he took Jeremy to his and Hazel's home. The diapers were a dead giveaway. Hazel used pampers and I used huggies. When Jamie needed changing, I used what I had in the house. Hazel had to have noticed the difference. I noticed when Jeremy came back from a ride with Jermaine wearing pampers in place of his usual huggies that this nigga is full of it. Once Jamie was born, Hazel reassessed her situation and must have decided she didn't need the aggravation of Jermaine in her life. In October 1987, while he was doing a series of concerts in Australia, she filed for divorce and demanded $25,000 a month in alimony, which included $7,500 in child support for her three children. At first, he complied and paid what she asked. The two months earlier, in August 1987, Jermaine's brother Jackie had become the first of the Jackson brothers to get a divorce. His wife, Enid, had caught Jackie having an affair with Paula Abdul. Here we go. We got action, bitches. Because Latoya was so evasive. She was like, oh, Enid followed uh, Jackie to the movies and uh, somehow he got hurt and, uh, and he couldn't be on the first part of the tour. That's what Latoya said. But Peggy, girl... I love you, girl. Well, Peggy was probably like, Jermaine ain't paying nobody no child support. This going to be my child support right here. 2300 Jackson Street. His wife Enid had caught Jackie having an affair with Paula Abdul. Caught probably isn't the right word. Jackie did little to keep it a secret during its long run. The affair came to a climax one evening in 1984, right before the start of the Jackson's Victory Tour. Jackie had taken Paula Abdul to the movies at a drive-in theater. Marlon's wife, Carol, found out about it and for some reason thought it would be a good idea to tell Enid, even though Enid and Jackie were separated at the time. I'm starting to see that. And Carl... That's the trouble making Enid home. jumped into Jackie's Mercedes Benz, drove in the theater, and located Jackie sitting beside Paula in his Range Rover. Enid yanked Paula out of the Range Rover by her hair and dragged her across the theater lot while Jackie tried to pull his wife away. Again, if you're going to be sleeping with other women's husbands, you got to get them hands together. No, no, girl, that's not how it works. You're going to have to fight back. Look at another woman's husband. Comes with hands, girl. Enid yanked Paula out of the Range Rover by her hair and dragged her across the theater lot while Jackie tried to pull his wife away. That's another problem. If I was Enid, I would be like, you going to help this They probably separated because of goddamn Paula Abdul. That's a problem to me. So this woman is the reason why we not in a loving relationship. It was more than that, y'all. It was more than that. But in your mind, you going through that in your mind, right? This woman right here is the reason why we're not together right now. And now you going to protect her? Bruh. Jackie was still trying to help Paula when Enid got back into the Mercedes. She jammed the car in reverse and ran it to Jackie's leg. The broken leg not only ended Jackie's marriage to Enid, but it also kept him from performing on the victory tour. Ow! What it didn't do was keep him from collecting his $5 million cut, a fact that Jermaine would never let go. These people are mess. These Jacksons are mess, bruh. I can't believe this, man. We were sleeping in the same bed, bruh. We grew up sleeping in the same friggin' bed in a two-bedroom house in 2300 Jackson Street. Three years later, Enid filed for a divorce, asking for $40,000 a month in support payments. When the legal smoke cleared, she was awarded $5,000 a month for herself and $3,500 a month for her children. Siggy and Brandy, plus 20% of Jackie's income, which amounted to more than a quarter of a million dollars, plus half of the royalties Jackie received on songs he composed during their marriage. As Enid quickly learned, though, winning the judgment is one thing, collecting the funds is another. 
In the end, she would collect just under $200,000 in the settlement. Then in September, Enid had Jackie arrested for violating the terms of their divorce. He had come to the sprawling house they once shared, a house previously owned by Rob Reiner and Penny Marshall, and tried to use the recording studio he built there. When Enid turned him away, he broke in through the French door leading into the kitchen. Right after the glass hit the floor, he was in police custody. Ooh. Is that what Randy Jackson got that jumping through glass windows bullshit from? Ask Jermaine about it. He took his brother's side and claimed that Enid had provoked the attack. According to Jermaine, he and Jackie were in the recording studio when Enid raced into the room, took off her shoe, and started to beat Jackie, calling him a hit in front of everyone. After Hazel threw him out, Jermaine moved in with Jeremy and me. The Jermaine that arrived at the condo was a defeated person. Not only had he been given the boot by his wife, he also had another big surprise to admit to me. JJ said, I only have $300 to my name. And you come here? I know Peggy is like, oh, Lord, all my dreams are shattered. Oh, oh I didn't marry Jerome Jackson. Damn it. I only have $300 to my name. He said in the same soft voice he had used when we first met. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Like all of his brothers, he had made $5 million from the Victory Tour in 1984, drove around in a Ferrari, and had a huge estate in Brentwood. How could he possibly be broke? Easy. Stunting. I was shocked by what he said, but told him not to worry, that we would manage somehow. Oh, oh good to Jesus. Oh, my God. Ah, no. No, no, no. Ah! 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 Lord, no. I would have heard the wrong Jackson. Ah! Ah! To generate some quick income, he was booked to perform a show in a stadium in Kenya and wanted me to go with him. I was nervous about leaving Jeremy with his nanny for the first time, even though it was only for a week. But I thought it would give Jermaine and me time to work things out. Child. He done tra traveled his ass all the way over there to Kenya. Not to get paid. I guess Africa be pulling stunts around there like these other janky promoters here in the States, girl. When we returned to California, it was as if we were coming back from our honeymoon. We settled into a life as a family and I discovered myself being thrust into the new role of manager. Jermaine's affairs were a mess. Despite the fact that he had received millions for the victory tour, he was deep in debt, particularly to the Internal Revenue Service. Like father, like son. He and Hazel had brought an expensive home and were driving around in expensive cars, but had barely enough to pay the light bill. Damn, T. Jermaine moved Hazel into a house in Beverly Hills that cost $25,000 a month to rent. The money from the sale of the estate went to pay back debts, many from the Precious Moments tour. Jermaine had borrowed heavily to finance the tour. A smart businessman like Michael would have gotten a sponsor to foot most of the cost, but none came forward for Jermaine. As far as I know, he was so intent on touring and so sure he would be received with as much hoopla as that surrounding the victory tour that he mortgaged his house and picked up the bill himself. The Precious Moments album went nowhere and so did the tour. God damn. After Hazel and Jermaine split, he performed in concert here and there. In the meantime, some money was coming in from his record deal with Arista, but his lifestyle far exceeded his income and was a continuing problem. The lease was coming up on our condo, and because of the financial drain on Jermaine's income, we decided to move. I found a two-bedroom condo on Wilshire Boulevard in Westwood, right across the street from where Jermaine's brother, Randy, lived. Compared with our condo, 
Randy's was a palace. Our place was a typical two-bedroom, two-bath condo with water-wall carpeting and a standard kitchen. I'd sit in our living room and look across the street at Randy's building. I'd watch his girlfriend at the time, a beautiful woman named Bernadette Roby, who is now married to Sugar Ray Leonard, pull her car up in the valet and disappear inside. Child, you didn't need to be jealous because while uh, Randy and Bernadette was over there, he was whooping He her. was back in the recording studio for his second album for Erster Records, Two Ships. At the same time, he began working with Randy, Jackie, and Tito on what would be the last Jackson album, 2300 Jackson Street, for CBS. Tito was the one responsible for organizing the album, which was being recorded at Ponderosa, his home-based studio in Encino. Finally, I got to meet Catherine. Well, sort of. I saw her in the driveway of Tito's house in her rose and waved in her direction. She looked in my direction, looked away, and drove off without waving back. I was hurt, but not surprised, considering her circumstances. When I told Jermaine that Jackie had invited us to join Paula and him at the movies, his response was strange. He said, be careful what you say to Jackie. I don't want him knowing any of our business. That's interesting, I thought to myself. In retrospect, the remark should have been my first clue that the brothers didn't trust one another. I'd later find out the entire family was party to this Jackson paranoia.